lost her. <laughs> That's only me two times in all these years. But anyway, I just would like to, and I think that Ted went to school with a lot of your daughters. I know he did. So anyway, in case you don't know Ted, Ted and Vicki, I would like to introduce my son, Ted, and his wife, whom he considers to be the best thing that ever happened to him. <laughs> and also, I have a special guest here who is my dear friend, and that's Judy Zulik. And of course, we're always happy that these other good friends who happen to not have to come very far, like Arlene and Betty and whoever else likes spring quick. I, I may be coming myself in these days. And anyway, uh, Ted has uh, taught government for, what did I ask him, what did you say? Uh, it was all about 30 years. About 30 years. And he is, a, anyway, he's a very patriotic person. And how I know this is last summer we had a family reunion and on Ted's right, he gave us a little lesson that I guess he gives to his history classes or government classes. And anyway, I was so impressed that I twisted his arm and made him come. And he was kind enough to do it. So anyway, I'll give Ted whatever time it takes to so we're out of here by coming. So, this is, and Vicki, you, Vicki, oh, she wants to take a picture of this so they can make a CD for their children. And I thought, why not? I like one of them. And, and it's all yours. No, my neighbor. Well, should I use this? Does this work? It's working. It's working? Because <coughs> I know when I give lessons elsewhere and folks who have little difficulty hearing appreciate, even though I have kind of a loud voice, so if I blast the rest of you out, I apologize for that. Uh, I, I am uh, thrilled to be here, really, for several reasons. Number one, it's almost a crime how infrequently I get back here to see my mom, and my sister, and my brother-in-law, and nieces and nephews, and, and all of their kids and so forth. It's, life's just too busy, I guess, but uh, there's no excuse for that, but I, it got me here today. And this is a great thing, so I appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, as I drove here today, reflecting back on this little valley of uh, Caribou County and Soda Springs, uh, we moved here 1966. My dad came and announced, we lived over in Montpelier, announced, hey, we're moving to Soda Springs. I got another job in Soda Springs with a bank. And I said, well, great, we'll see you when you get back. I'm not moving. <laughs> we almost had a mutiny in the family here because I'd grown up with a lot of uh, great young men and young women as well. but, but Athletics was a big part of my life, always has been, and always will be. And we were going to have a great basketball team in Montpelier. Uh, I was a sophomore, starting my junior year. So uh, they convinced me, I guess, to, uh, to come to Soda Springs. And what a great decision that was. Uh, I count many of you and your children among my best friends to this very day on this planet right here in Soda Springs. Uh, we had great success athletically. Uh, we actually should have won a state championship two years in a row. We only won it one, but, uh, should have won it my junior and senior year. But, and so those, those guys that I played ball with, you know, Preston Phelps was of the world, and Mike Coleman, and, and, uh, and uh, Ryan Hale, and so forth, Daryl Ray Lindsay and others, still are among my best friends on this planet. We're going to have our 55th class reunion, not this summer, a year from now. 
and we've had one every five years, and it's, it's, it's great fun. So, what year did you graduate? 1967. 1967 was the year. Yeah. Uh, other great experiences. Uh, I went on a mission for the LDS Church, left from here, came back to here. Uh, my dad passed away in 1976. Uh, life experiences, I would have rather done without that one, but that's life experience as well. And so much of my life is tied up in this little valley right here. And so I'm grateful to come back. It's beautiful, just absolutely gorgeous, coming over that pass. And it's, uh, so it's good to be here and, and rub shoulders with you folks who I know, and some of you I don't know, okay? Uh, <clears throat> As, as my mom said, I've taught government for, I don't know, 112 years. I, don't know, I, don't know. I taught political science at the College of Southern Idaho. I own my own driver's ed business. Maybe you saw the driver's ed cards you pulled out up there. That's the you need to drive, you need to drive home. I'll let you drive the Camaro. It's okay. Anyway, uh, my wife and I both retired just this year from teaching government and political science. We're down to one job now, just the driver's ed business. Uh, I still miss it. I do. You know, a lot of folks say, oh, what a relief. And, and it is. It's a great thing. But uh, I do miss it. I miss, particularly this election year, I miss it. Uh, it. There's a few things that I feel strongly about, and one of them is uh, the blessing that it is to live in these United States of America. Okay? Uh, and so I'd like to talk a little bit about some of these uh, some of these feelings that I have and continue to have as, as we move along today. I promise I won't be long. I know you'd like to. Isn't there refreshments? <laughs> <laughs> gotta, get the most, no. gotta get those refreshments. I promise we won't be too verbose or too long-winded here, but I'd like to share with you two or three things. Um, Proud to be an American. Is that, that, is your, uh, that is your theme tonight, am I correct? Mm -hmm. okay. Before I share a few <coughs> thoughts, there's a great lot of wisdom in this room right here, sitting in front of me right now. I would like to hear, if there's anyone willing to volunteer, what your thoughts are on why you are in fact proud to be an American. Would that, would that be permissible? Anybody want to volunteer to share with us a reason why you value that you are proud to be an American citizen? Anyone? Our it's freedom. okay. Please. Our freedom. Freedom. Yeah, look, that's what I love. Freedom, okay. Most of the rest of the world would give any and everything they have to be in our shoes today in this country. Pardon me? They're trying to come. Well, they are trying to come. <laughs> the, the best example I can give you is most of the rest of the world has to build walls to keep their people in. We are struggling, you know, to keep the rest. I mean, we want to be congenial, but, you know, there's a great influx of folks wanting to come here and share Hopefully that's the only reason they're wanting to come, but to share what you and I enjoy, and in many cases I fear take for granted, the freedoms of the engine. Okay. Are there other thoughts? Why? Please. All you have to do is go to another country or third world or someplace, and you're very grateful to come back. Absolutely. My daughter and her husband, that right after they were married, went to Russia to teach English. One of the first letters home I remember this distinctly. She says, Mom, Dad, I went to the grocery store to get some groceries and some supplies, and they didn't have any, very little. I remember saying this, they didn't have any toilet paper. <laughs> I told her, well, you know, the monkey wards catalog. <laughs> make sure we remove the staples before use, but you see what I'm saying there? They didn't have any. You know, we got 900 brands of cereal, they had one, you know. A couple, three loaves of bread, and we go home and we do we don't have 27 choices and we think we've been rained on. Okay, so much of the rest of the world, that's true. Now, are there other thoughts, please? 
Please, yes. Well, I grew up in East Germany. Ah, okay. And until I was about 25, and then we went to the West, uh, which was a bit different from communism. But then I had an invitation to come here, and my eyes were opened right in New York. <laughs> it was a wonderful country. We came for the gospel's sake and have enjoyed every day. Fatal flaw of communism is it wants to dominate every aspect of your life. Everybody's life. <coughs> Political, social, religious, financial. They want to dominate it all. That ability to choose that we enjoy is not enjoyed by much of the rest of the world. Please. Well, I love the American flag and the music that we sing every time we sing songs about America, we get chills. And we're so thankful that what we do get here and has a feeling that we do. But I start saying a banner and even this land is your land. Everything is <laughs> awesome to me. Wonderful. Wonderful. Now, you'll think I planted her when we no. get done. You'll think I just talked to her as she walked in the door. And said, would, you, would you say what she just said? Because it dovetails so well with what I would like to share with you here in just a few minutes. Are there other thoughts before? Yes, please. I'm afraid we're going to lose our dreams because I read on Facebook the other day when they're trying to take in New York the bands from playing how great that was. Things are changing. Um, we must be vigilant. We must be vigilant. We have to become involved. We have to become involved to protect the rights and the freedoms that we have. Because uh, you've heard that old cliche, freedom isn't free, and that's absolutely true. There have been well over one million soldiers, men, women, both, die in defense of this country from its inception in 1776 till this very day. Over one million have given that last full measure of devotion, as Lincoln said, to protect the freedoms that we enjoy. And many millions more have been maimed, and, you know, wounded, and of course it's not just those gross soldiers. How about the families who lost loved ones, who when, even if they came home they were impaired in some way. What great sacrifices those families have made for the freedoms of the enjoy. Please, yes. I've read this book, The Seven Miracles That Saved America. Okay. We need to pray awful hard for the eighth miracle. <laughs> All right. I accept that. Absolutely. We, you know, things are changing. They are. Thank you. Please. What really impressed me, I was reading the other day of how the song was written. I can't remember what the name of it was, that our flag was still standing. <laughs> how the body bodies held the flag. Wonderful. So now, I, you're going to see, I planted them both. <laughs> yeah. There's two plants right there. One, two, they're sitting pretty close. They got together. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do with you for the next few minutes is share with you the story that these two ladies have alluded to. Okay? Um, Francis Scott Key, you've heard of this man before? A lawyer in the city of Baltimore, Baltimore, Maryland, lawyer. Uh, the United States was engaged in a brutal war with the mother country, England. Some of uh, called this war a second revolutionary war. It was actually the War of 1812. War of 1812. If you recall, maybe from your history, just a couple of days ago, and you were all sitting in history class, that the United States Capitol was burned by the British. The White House, President Madison, was driven from the White House, and part of the White House was burned by the British in this very war that we're talking about. The Washington Monument, to, to commemorate, the, in my mind, the greatest president we've ever had, that being George Washington, we wouldn't have gotten this bird off the ground without George Washington. And so, in my humble opinion, he was an indispensable force in getting this nation uh, uh, started. That, that monument was rising. You, maybe you've been to Washington, D.C. and seen the Washington Monument. It was stopped 
the erection of the Washington Monument was stopped during this war and wasn't proceeded with, wasn't continued and finished till years later. In fact, if you go there today, you can see where it was stopped because the granite is different colors as it proceeds up to the up to the apex of the Washington Monument. So it was during this time, this War of 1812, uh, protracted war, brutal war as all wars are, many prisoners had been uh, taken by both the British and the American forces. Many thousands of prisoners on both sides. The United States government contacted the British government and said, we would like to send a man out and see if we can arrange a settlement, a, a swap of prisoners, if you will, so that we can repatriate both the British and the American prisoners that, are be that were being held in deplorable conditions. Deplorable conditions. Uh, our prisoners were being held in ships off of the coast of the Chesapeake Bay in Baltimore, Maryland, about a thousand yards off of the off of the shoreline. The American government said we'd like to send out Francis Scott Key to negotiate a one-for-one -one swap with the British and uh, repatriate both sides and their prisoners. The British agreed to this. So Francis Scott Key gets in a rowboat and rows out the thousand yards out to the British warship where the, where the commanders were located. And he negotiated in a long period of time, and, and he was successful, where they would swap prisoners one for one, one American for one English prisoner, so that they could go back and, and be repatriated in their homelands. Francis Scott Key went down to the bottom hold of the ship, where our prisoners were being, were being held in that ship. And he said, men, I have great news for you. For tonight, you will be free. I have negotiated your freedom tonight. And they were excited. They were excited. They were excited. And there were, you will be free from your chains, from the filth that was down in the hold of that ship, and, and be repatriated back in the on American <laughs> soil. Obviously, the prisoners were thrilled. Francis Scott P. was thrilled. He went up to the upper decks to arrange for the passage of our prisoners back on American soil, and when he went up to the, uh, the upper levels of the ship again and uh, contacted the commanding admiral of the British Navy, the, the admiral said, we have a little problem here. We're going to honor, we're going to honor our commitment to exchange these, these prisoners. However, this will be a moot point as of tonight. And Francis Scott Key said, what do you mean? And he said, we have laid, the British, has, have laid an ultimatum on the American government. Either capitulate, give in, to uh, and take down that flag that you are so proud of, and give in and lose the war and become a British subject again, or we will obliterate that fort right over there. Fort McHenry was the name of that fort. And Francis Scott Key said, how can that be? And the Admiral says, take a look out on the horizon, out on the ocean. And Francis Scott Key gazed out on the ocean. He sees dots out on the horizon, coming over the horizon. Many, many, hundreds of dots. And he said, what is that? And he said, that's the entirety of the British fleet the greatest navy the world had ever produced up till that point. That was the entirety of the British Navy coming to this locale. He said, we, are, we have given the American government a way out. All they have to do is take down the flag from that rampart over on that, that Fort McKenna. The shelling will not occur, and if it's going, it will stop you will become under British rule again. Francis Scott Key went down to the hold of the ship again and explained to the prisoners down there what, what had just transpired about. The prisoners said they can't, they, they can't shell that fort. 
it's predominantly not a military fort. It's got women, it's got children. It's not predominantly a military fort. And uh, the British Admiral said, all they have to do is pitch in, give in, and there will be no shelling at all. The prisoner said, we cannot give in. We must not give in. We must not give in. The Admiral says the fleet will be here within two hours, and they arrived two hours later. As, as dusk settled over the, uh, the bay there, uh, mist hung low over the bay as the British warships approached. They opened fire. Francis Scott Key reported that the fire was incessant. There was no let up. Gun after gun, rocket after rocket, bomb after bomb was being was being rained down on that fort, Fort McKinley. The nighttime sky was lit up by those bombs and those rockets. And Francis Scott Key reported to the soldiers, the, uh, the prisoners down, down in the ship, I'll go up and I'll report down to you what's going on here, what's going on, as I can see it. And so, he went up aboard the ship. The shelling began. The nighttime sky was red with rockets and bombs. And as the bombs exploded near the parapet the, uh, of the, where the flag was being flown, he could see that the flag was still up. The prisoner said, tell us, tell us, what's going on? Is the flag still there? Francis Scott Key reported, yes, it is still there. The Admiral came after two and a half hours of incessant shelling and said to, to Francis Scott Key, I can't understand your people. This is, this is an untenable situation. This is not a winnable situation for you in any way, shape, or form. You will lose. There is no need for this slaughter to take place. There is no need. And then Francis Scott Key reported to the Admiral, he said, what he remembered what George Washington had once said. He said, the American patriot would rather stand on his feet in freedom than to live on his knees, subjected to a foreign war. The prisoners, all, all that Francis Scott Key could hear from that hold as he reported down to them, a prayer, a prayer. Dear God, please, Take down that flag. The Admiral said, we're now going to train all guns on that flag. That rampart is what it was called. We're going to, all of the guns of the British Navy are not, we're going to take that flag down. They began shelling all concentrated on that one spot. The prisoners, is the flag still flying? Is the flag still flying? Tell us about the flag. Francis Scott Key reported again. Yes, the flag is still flying. Dawn approached. Dawn approached. Again, mists hung low over the bay, but the parapet where the flag was flying was high enough above those mists to where Francis Scott Key could see the flag was still at the top of that flagpole. The flagpole itself was at a skewed angle, a weird or a, not straight up and down. It was at a skewed angle, that's the best way to put it. Francis Scott Key got into his boat. After conversing with the Admiral, he said, I can't understand this. Our reconnaissance, the reconnaissance, the British reconnaissance, has reported that that flagpole has been hit repetitious times, many times, over, and how can it still be standing? Francis Scott Key got into his boat, went to the, went to the fort, went up to the fort where the flag, the, uh, the rampart was, and he could see that the flag was in tatters, it was torn, it had been hit numerous times direct hits, numerous times. 
the flagpole was at a skewed angle. However, when that was when that flagpole was hit and the flag went down, <coughs> patriots, men, brothers, sons, walked over. who knew what it meant to have that flag on the ground and held <laughs> that flag pulled up humanly. 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 Knowing all the time that all of the guns of the British Navy were centered on that very spot. Very spot. Knowing it was a suicide mission. When they were killed, their bodies were removed and others <coughs> took their place. Others took their place and held that flag all up. When we sing this song that was penned by Francis Scott Key as a result of this event, it's in all of our hymnals. We sing it before every ball game. civic event, we've all signed it thousands of times, thousands of times. And yet I wonder if we really thought what those words actually meant. And because of this little story that I've shared with you today, hopefully the next time we sing that, that it will take on increased meaning. He penned the, the song. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light. What so proudly we hail at the twilight's last gleam. Or the rocket's red glare. The bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave. The debt was demanded. The debt was in fact paid. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail the twilight's last gleaming Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rockets red the bombs bursting there gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet
and the war's desolation. Blessed with victory and peace, may the heavens rescue land. Praise the power that made and preserved us a nation. Then conquer we must when our cause it is just. And this be our motto in God is our trust. And the star spangled banner in triumph shall wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the Yes, 
out of patriotism to what's right. I could, you know, I had strong feelings about everything we talked about, but I did have to be able to defend both sides equally well. Yeah, I can still do that. That's okay. But there's definitely thoughts about all of these things. Anything else about the government that you'd like to know about that I can help you with? Yeah. Wasn't the government set up so that no matter what happened or what will happen, it will not fall? Did I hear that somewhere? Well, I mean, the diffusion of power is a genius system. Division of power. Okay? We've got three branches of government. Executive, legislative, and judicial. Legislative branch makes the law. Executive branch is supposed to enforce the law. And the judicial branch is to interpret the law. And I believe we've blurred some of those lines a little bit to where, you know, that's not been the case here. But the Founding Fathers were a genius in the way they set up this Constitution. They were absolutely genius. And in my humble opinion, God inspired. I would just be right there with you. Do you believe that all of this political correctness that we hear about is going to be the downfall? Well... Don't you think that has something to do with all of this blurring and blending and changing? When people get a little power, they want to maintain that power. Whatever it takes to maintain the power, even at the expense of doing what's right or wrong. In many cases, they just want to keep that power and expand that power. And that's unfortunate. But we, the people, the first three words of the preamble of the Constitution are the key to that not happen. A lot of people, well, we don't have any power. Yeah, we do. Not as individuals, but as groups. We have the power. Do you see? Do you see a, a turning kind of of um, the citizens of this country from uh, working for what they believe and waiting for the government? I, I fear I do. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm the first one to want to help anybody that needs help, and I'm sure you all fit in that category. If they actually need help, um, we got to help. We've got to help them, but we need to expect them to help themselves. We do. You know, no one is benefited when people get something for nothing. They don't appreciate it, <laughs> and they don't, you know, they don't appreciate the ones who have given it to them. We have generations of people that have lived that way for generations. Yeah, yeah. yeah that rugged individualism that them. you all are so familiar with. Much more, well, I'm not too much. But you all are aware of that. You know, when you grew up, that's you, know, you didn't rely on anybody but you, right? Government and other people. They need some help, you need to help them, but there's way too much of that. Please. Our vote is very important. It is. Uh, we had a commissioner friend at one time, he was in Lincoln County, and he had opposition and he won by one vote. They had a recount, he won by two. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, every vote counts, that's true. Uh, let's see, Andrew Johnson was impeached. Yeah. Came within one vote of being removed from office. One more senator had voted against him. He'd been removed. So every vote. We had a deal in Twin Falls where they were going to build a, I don't know, a building for, to benefit both CSI and Twin Falls. They had an election. 3,200 people showed up to vote. 1,700 of them voted against building that building. I'm not saying that was the right decision or wrong decision, but 1,700 people made the decision for all 50,000 people who lived in Twin 1,700. And so this, this massive participation, a democracy works well when people participate in a massive way because the genius of democracy is that most of the people, the majority of the people, will make the right decision most of the time. Not all the time, but most of the time. They will. Okay? But when you get fewer and fewer people participating, the chances of making those positive and right decisions shrink as well. Now, please, I... So, um, as you were teaching kids, you know, how do you, how do you ignite within them 
that desire to um, to become active or to take notice of what is going on. And because a lot of them will say exactly that. They're, you know, I don't make a difference or it's already been decided. Or, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, as I studied the lives of the founding fathers, you know, for example, another example maybe to illustrate what I'm talking about. A lot of folks uh, um, think that the founding fathers, the revisionists of history, would have you believe that these men were not God-fearing men, that they were, you know, they didn't have any religious conviction. Well, that's 100% mule muffins. Sorry. <laughs> They, they were not all of the same religion, as we all are not of the same religion, but they were religious, God-fearing men. They were, every one of them. Every one of them. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, in the Declaration of Independence, he said, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights. There's no more blatant description reference to be a, a God than that. The, the, the end of the declaration, with a firm reliance upon divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Another reference to, to God. Benjamin Franklin, when they were putting together the Constitution, he said, if a sparrow cannot fall without God's notice, how can a great nation hope to arise without his aid? And he suggested, after much bickering for the first weeks of the Constitutional Convention, that they begin their sessions with prayer. And they did. Are they and still they, doing that? They are. Congress begins every day with a prayer. Now, that, I mean, does that shock anybody? Maybe. Maybe a little bit, but they still do. Now, they pass it around. It's not all the same denomination they have. Well, you don't need to have all the no, 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 no. So certainly, I'm, we're not putting together an idea where well, religion and the government ought to be the same. That's not it at all. But the idea that we can talk about religious kinds of things in an open public setting, you want to lose a lot of friends and make a lot of enemies if you do that. But uh, the founding fathers did do that. They had no qualms about that as you study the lives of these great men. Other questions? I, mean, I don't want to pull you. Yeah, I don't dear. think you answered her question. Oh. Because <laughs> her question was, how do you inspire the students nowadays that don't believe? Well, I, we talk about these, the founding fathers, we do. And, and uh, uh, the commitment that they made, the commitment that these men made, um, most people don't realize this, but the founding for those 56 men who signed that document, the, the Declaration of Independence, when they signed it, they were literally signing their own death warrants. Because had we lost that Revolutionary War, and by all rights we should have, there's no way the little teeny 13 colonies are going to beat the British, the greatest power the world had ever produced. No way that's going to happen. Had we not won that war, these men that we meet here as founding fathers, and the George Washington, the Ben Franklin, John Adams, and the rest, would have been hung for treason. They would have been hung, and they knew it. Yet they were willing to put their lives on them. That same level of commitment needs to be forthcoming with us. Us, and a younger generation, I you know, try to part to them, those kinds of things to try to, uh, you know, young people are hard to influence, they are. Some of them get it, many of them don't. But if you get, get a few, you get to think a little bit about what, what they have. And the blessing that it is to be here. Uh, we better just. Anything else? Please. Um, I understand this right. I think it was the race or something. And they had an election and it was a tie. Uh -huh. They recounted it and they uh, decided by the flip of a coin with a big place to do it, something like that. How would they? Yeah, I, you know, not very big. Uh, it, the chances of a tie vote, you know, for example, if there's 50 million people who vote in the United States, 
to get 25 million each, uh, I mean, you could have won the lottery all 54 times in the same day and have, you know, have a chance <laughs> I, I to it. <laughs> oh yeah, they, I've heard of flipping coins and when they tie, flip a coin. That's two out of three falls or arm wrestle. No, I'm just kidding on that. <laughs> I've heard of flipping coins. Yeah. 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 Explain to me, they say on the news that all this political stuff is going on, when a certain man wins, he will be taken out and replaced with another nominee for president. Explain to me how that works. I don't know why I do that in two minutes, one minute. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's primaries and caucuses. Caucuses are meetings of like-minded people. They meet in dozens, hundreds of places throughout a given state. Iowa being the first one to hold a caucus. They have campaign speeches and then they, you know, everybody for Trump's over here and everybody for Bush is over here and the rest of them. And they count noses and they turn in their account to the in this case, the Republican Central Committee in Iowa. I'm just using Iowa because that's the first one. Democrats do the same thing. And then delegates are assigned to the, the state party convention, ultimately the national party convention, commensurate with the level of support that each candidate gets in those caucuses. They do the same thing with primaries. Primary people go to the polls. Some states have a winner take all. For example, if Donald Trump wins a, over 50% of the vote today in New York, he will get virtually all of those 95 Republican delegates to go to the Republican National Convention. If he is denied the 50% of the vote, then it will be split up amongst the, the three, the three that are remaining. And that you know, some states have a co combination of caucuses and primaries, some it's winner take all, some it's proportional. But the bottom line is each party is going to go to a national convention this summer, the summer before. Uh, usually the Republicans will be first because they're out of, out of power, and the Democrats will be second, and they will narrow down their candidates to one. Now, what I think what you're referring to is though, if no candidate gets 1,237 delegates in the Republican primary, then we have what is called a brokered convention, where the delegates, they're bound to vote for their candidate on the first ballot. Sometimes the states will bind them for two ballots. Some states will free up their delegates to vote for their own conscience after the first ballot. And so some may, they'll be raiding their delegates to come over with the other guy and the other guy. It's going to be a interesting, uh, hasn't happened for a long, long time, but it's not unprecedented, it's happened before. <coughs> and the rules have been set up a long time ago. It's not, they're just changing the rules in midstream here. Uh, these rules have been set up. They may not be great rules, but they've been set up for a long time. Please. Xylophone always had a caucus, didn't they just barely start that? They just started it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've had a primary, only a primary, and now we can. Which is the best? They both do about the same thing. You know, it's just the caucuses are kind of long. You know, they last three, four, five hours sometimes. But uh, you know, it's grassroots. You know, if you're for one candidate, you get to stand up and say, "Hey, I like this guy because we be do, we be do, whatever it is." And the next guy, I, I like him because of. Him. And at the end of the night, they just get him over in the corner and. Help knows if you don't go to the caucus, then you don't have a vote for the Yep. And like I say, that's vote that we enjoy. A lot of people complain about the you know, government. Oh, well, who'd you vote for? I didn't vote. <laughs> then sir or madam, <laughs> you got no leg to stand on. Just hush. I was going to say shut up, but that'd be kind of naughty. If you can't take the opportunity to vote, you shouldn't yeah. complain what you get because you get what you get. You can't participate. So. Okay, I, I don't know. If there's more during the cookie, you know, please come. Happy to do it. So thank you, ladies. Appreciate it. Very much. Thank you. Show off. Or you, well, slide over there. So little rep sit. Okay. Thanks for coming, everybody. What we have here, for those of you who are looking in on the thing here, is uh, my troops have agreed to come over on a Sunday and, uh, and be my class, I guess, as, you, as it were, uh, and participate a little bit and see if we can make this a little more realistic rather than me just talking into the camera and so forth. That's the reason. So, 
Uh, and we might even learn something about uh, our subject matter today, which is the Declaration of Independence. Uh, in my opinion, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States are the two greatest documents in the history of the world. Not just the United States, but the world. Uh, they, they hold out the greatest principles and hope for the rest of the world. If everybody would adopt these principles, they would be way better off. And so what we, we're going to talk about that, and we'll get some input from you folks here as we go along here. I'd like to start by asking what you already know about the Declaration of Independence. Anything at all. Anything that jumps to your mind. I don't care what it is. They wrote a song about it. They did, and we're going to learn that song <laughs> today, or a little, a little bit. We won't go through the we'll go through the whole thing once, but anyway, we'll we'll go through that. What else do you know about the Declaration of Independence? Anybody? It had to be unanimously signed by all the thirteen colonies. Bingo! Unanimously adopted by all thirteen colonies. Now. If we know something about the struggles that went into getting the Declaration of Independence even to be talked about and ultimately written and then ultimately adopted, the chances of them being unanimous was, began to be somewhere between slim and none and slim just left the building. It was not going to happen. But over the course of time, a long period of time, the, uh, the opposition came around and, uh, and there was even one who walked out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the Independence Hall that could not adopt or could not uh, assign his name to that document and, uh, because that's what it had to be, is unanimous. They couldn't pit brother against brother, state against state. And, and it was a, John Hancock was the one who proposed, who agreed to that, not proposed it, but agreed to it. And he recognized the utility of making sure that if we were going to stay as a British colony, we needed to all stay as a British colony. If we were going to do the independence thing, we all needed to walk and, and make sure that that happened. Okay, what else does anybody know about that? The finalized signing was in 1776. Okay, 1776. Do you know the date? February, <laughs> July, July 4th. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick. Okay. July 4th, 1776. Now, Elise, Reagan, what were you guys doing last July 4th? Watching fireworks. Fireworks over at CSI, TV. right? Yeah. Anything else? Eating hot dogs. Eating hot dogs. Yeah, burnt the dogs out there. Yeah, the National room. Hot Dog Day. Mm -hmm. National Hot Dog Day. We consume a lot of hot dogs in this country. Okay, anything else that you did? We enjoyed it with our family. Okay, and you, the reason you could enjoy it with your family is it's a national holiday. Yeah. Okay, and most people have the day off. The only exception to that would be retail, people who work retail. They're all hands are on deck in retail shops because all the rest of the folks have, have the day off. It's a national holiday. And everybody goes out and buys the hot dogs, fireworks, does, does I can think of one other company that isn't necessarily a company. Well, that's true. What is that company, Rhett? SOS Driving School. SOS Driving School. We don't give them the day. <laughs> <laughs> that's a big J to drive. We start early and we stay late. <laughs> Sorry about that. We're gonna have we're gonna have a strike from the employees later. Okay. Uh, anything else? Anybody notice? July 4, 17th. It was adopted, by the way. Okay. It was adopted. It wasn't written then, so it, it wasn't even signed then. But it was adopted, July 4, 1776. Now, I wanted to sum up what I was about to say here. We were all having fun on July 4, and that's a great thing. Family and all. That's a great thing. But my hope is, after we go through what we're going to go through here in the next little while, that next July 4th, it takes on an added measure of importance because of the adoption of this great, great document. Okay. Anything else? Somebody knows anything? Something else? It was a risky move and considered an act of treason where they all put their lives on the line by signing it. Bingo! 
Bingo. And we're going to come to that and we're going to talk about that extensively here in just a few minutes. An act of, had this ever been done before? What was the purpose of it? What, what did it accomplish? Independence. Independence from? The king. The king of? England. England. Okay. We were in effect by signing that document declaring war on the greatest military, economic, political nation the world had yet produced in England. They were the alpha male of the family of nations at that time. They were the top dog on the totem pole, whatever you want to say. The most powerful nation the world had ever produced was England. Have you ever heard the phrase, the sun never sets on the British Empire? Have you ever heard? heard of it? Yeah. Well, it's true. All over the world. Were, were British colonies, and one of those was the little 13 colonies here in America. About Australia, how'd that get started? Anybody know? Place to send prisoners. Prisoners from England. It was a penal colony. That's right. Remember a Quigley Down Under? Okay, coming back to it. Okay. Anyway, huge, huge influence all over the world was Britain. And now these little teeny 13 colonies were declaring themselves free and independent of the King of England. Had this ever been done before? No. Not in the history of the world. This is unique, brand new, first time. They were Never too been scared. done. And the chance was once again of them being successful. <coughs> no way. And we'll talk about the ramifications of that in, uh, and we're coming right back to what Alicia said here in just a second or two. Anything else? Can you, anybody know anything else about it? There are multiple sections and parts to it. There, there are several, yeah, there's several sections to it, okay? It's not an extensive document. I'm going to give you a copy here in just a second. It's about two pages long, two and a half pages. There were several people on the committee to write it, but Thomas Jefferson was the, uh, who wrote the most, uh, the bulk of it. Okay, primary author is how I phrase this, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson, one of the great men we have ever produced in this country. Thomas Jefferson. Now, he was a man subject to the foibles of all men. Okay, we won't go into that, but he was. He was not a perfect individual, but brilliant. Absolutely a brilliant individual. Invented. Quick example of that. Uh, <clears throat> John F. Kennedy was hosting a, a dozens of Nobel laureates. These are people who have won the Nobel Prize for physics, you know, Peace Prize, and, uh, literature and all of the, all of the different uh, uh, different things that he, he was he was hosting dozens of them and he, as they always do they have dinner and they were toasting John F Kennedy said he said we the white house is hosting the greatest aggregation of brain power it has ever hosted except when thomas jefferson dined alone <laughs> he's as far as Dined alone. All right, so Thomas Jefferson, you know, farmer, uh, inventor. inventor. Of stove. What's that? Inventor of the stove. Oh, who invented the stove? Thomas Jefferson. Are you sure? Oh, yeah. <coughs> oh, well, the Franklin. The Franklin stove. The Franklin, the Franklin stove, stove was stove. Benjamin. Yeah. The Benjamin. swivel Franklin chair was. Swivel chair. But he was a, the swivel chair, which I had one. Swivel chair. Yeah. Uh, the rotation of crops. Why do you rotate crops? Why do farmers rotate crops? They got potatoes one year and beans the next and sorghum the next. Why did they do that? Yeah. Renutriate uh, the soil. Yeah. Keeps the soil. Give it a chance to, yeah. to breathe and to regenerate itself. They just put potatoes every year. Yeah. Yeah. That's not going to work. The soil is going to be depleted. He introduced that. Um, and of course, the author of the Declaration of Independence, he was the. Uh, the Virginia, the first president of the University of Virginia. If you ever been to Charlottesville, I never have, but studied it. The ellip, the ellipse is what they call them, the large columns. They were his invention. They were they were designed by him. He was an architect, great architect. He was the architect of his own home at Monticello. If you ever get a chance to go to Monticello, back in Virginia, you need to go. Beautiful, beautiful. Multi-talented individual, but. Uh, he became the Secretary of State, he became the Vice President, he became the President, and of course the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. Now, what Rhett was saying is true, there were five men on that, on that committee. 
Uh, do you know the other four? Uh, Roger Sherman, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Robert Sherman, Livingston. And Robert Livingston. And Roger Sherman. I said Roger, Roger first. Well, you said Roger Sherman. Okay. I was just trying to remember the so 1776. Okay. John Adams, Ben Franklin, Robert Livingston, Roger Sherman, Thomas Jefferson. Those were the four. Now, the other four contributed in minimal ways, but it was Thomas Jefferson's baby. This declaration, he wrote it. He wrote it. Okay. Anything else? Anybody knows? We've got to move on here, but that's okay. Where was it signed? Where was it designed? Pennsylvania. Philadelphia. Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay. Uh, 56 men met there. I think it was early in May when they first came there. And, uh, and those 56 men um, constructed, adopted the Declaration of Independence in Independence Hall. By the way, the Constitution of the United States was also hammered out in Independence Hall in Philadelphia. In my humble opinion, hallowed ground. Okay, now anything else? Anything else? Okay. All right, what we're going to do here, I'm going to give you a copy. Well, you kind of have to share, I think. We'll give you one for the price of two here or something. And one for you guys. And one for you guys. And one for you guys. Dear, you have to. I know it if we're okay. just singing it. Okay. <laughs> like I say, it's only about two pages long. I it. I should have given it to you before you came to you to read it and so forth, because that's okay. Uh, <clears throat> there, the most important section is the second paragraph, in my opinion. The most important section is the second paragraph. If you see where it, see, see where it says, we hold these truths, you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and so what we're going to do... And we're not, we won't do the whole thing. We're going to sing the song here. <laughs> we won't go through just like we did in class here, but we'll go through the time too. But here's, here it is. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. That whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new governments. Laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, <clears throat> all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations Pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. All right, that, we're going to sing that. We're gonna, now, we sing it a whole bunch of times, and we're not going to sing it a whole bunch of times, but I'll sing it once, and then we'll go through the first section. Just, you know, we won't go through the whole thing here, but just so you can hear it once here. What's the name of the group that is singing for it with us? Oh yeah, this is the fifth dimension. Those you're all too young to remember the fifth dimension, but the most famous song they sang was uh, Aquarius, let the sun shine in. You know. So they were a seventies group, and yeah. Ted and I went on one of our dates to see them. Yep. In fact, this that was the first time I ever heard this song is on that day. Hmm. They sang it. In fact, they, they, they preface this song by saying, you'll never hear the next song on the radio. <laughs> I, I never have either, by the way. 
because it's too controversial. Now, there's nothing controversial about this, as far as I'm concerned, but I've never heard it on the radio. But that being a political science, uh, you know, that's what I was majoring in, major, I thought, hey, I can use this, and I've used it ever since. It's been kind of, from day one, the first class I ever taught in high school, back in Highland High School in 1973, I've used it every year. And all around the world, wherever we've traveled, sometimes we've even pulled into gas stations. And they said, Oh, Mr. Larson, I still know the Declaration of Independence song. <laughs> so it is a good thing to learn things by music. Dirk Cutter, no, this is going to be too long. Dirk Cutter's the, uh, now the head coach of the, I think it's Tampa Bay now. He was the offensive coordinator for the Atlanta Falcons. He was one of my first students back at Highland High School. He was quarterback for Highland. Uh, his dad was the coach. And, and uh, he was the football coach. Let's see. It was a, I think it was Boise State. He was football coach at Idaho State, Boise State, Arizona State, uh, you know, Boston College, and Missouri, and all that stuff. Anyway, he's now the head coach of the. But he was in a coaching clinic. He was doing the football portion, and I was doing the softball portion. He saw me across the room, he came hustling over, and he didn't say, hello, Mr. Larson, how you doing? He started to sing this song. <laughs> oh. And it was about yeah, 15 years after he did it. He, he didn't know all, but he didn't know anything. Okay, that's more than you want to know about that. So here we go. All right, here we go. Let's see if this is the right one. Oh, yeah. You can follow along here, and it'll be your turn when I get done. No people in there. <laughs> yeah. sign you in. We hold these truths to be self-evident That all men are created equal That they are endowed by their creator With certain unalienable rights That among these Pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted over men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the government. This is your soul right here. <laughs> That's you right there every time. <laughs> that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government.
We do one section and then we talk about it and we're going to talk about it. We're going to interpret this in just a minute, but we won't so we'll just sing the one section we'll dive into two here. All right, just to get you a feel for here we go. We'll start again. We hold these truths. We all know. Everybody is, is, we can't learn this. We can't learn it. In two or three days they do it all. Because they put it together with the music. Here we go. We, we hold these truths. <coughs> To be self-evident <coughs> That all men are created equal And they are endowed by the Creator With certain unalienable rights That among these are life, liberty Securities rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the power. Hey, tell me, Beast, this is you. <laughs> No, just kidding. You know, I just kidding. <laughs> You want to sing it up and off, deep down, and it's okay. One more time, and then we got to move on. Just one more time. Then we got to move on. Oh, we're singing it back yeah. again? Yeah. Oh. It's just to Elise's part. Some of the boys, they couldn't <laughs> sing that high, so I said, just go down and off. Some of the girls, you know, so whatever octave you want. What's an octave, Mr. Larson? Yeah. We hold these truths to be self evident. <laughs> That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of times like that and they'd learn a song. When, we, when they got on to it a little bit, then we'd interpret what we were talking about here. Because that's the most important thing to understand. What in the world do these words mean? So let's go through that for just a minute. What's the first words there? We hold these truths. Hey, who's we? We. Who's we? The U.S. The folks. The people, right? The first words of the preamble is we the people. So that's what, that's what we're talking about. This is the folks. We, the folks, hold these truths. Now what's a truth? One plus one is two. What? One plus one is two. Math. Okay. Indisputable That's a true. facts. Undis indisputable facts. Yeah. Indisputable facts. Is there a timeline associated with a truth? No. No, there's not. Now, this, this is a new, new concept to a lot of folks, most kids. You, know, you ask them that and they, you know, they, they, I don't know. Okay. You know, the sun comes up in the east and sets in the west, kind of thing. That's the truth, right? Okay. Um, and there is no timeline uh, for an absolute truth. If it was true, if it's true, it was true yesterday. It's true today. It's going to be true tomorrow and forever. Always been true. Two or three examples that we might use. Um, <clears throat> is it a truth to say, uh, 
if you smoke cigarettes, it's going to be harmful to your health. No. Is that a truth? Yes. Yes. It is. Now, 100 years ago, did they recognize that truth? No. <laughs> even when even the church was first organized, you know, there were spittoons all over the floor. <laughs> you know, and all that stuff. They were hawking the tobacco and going all that. Okay. But, so we didn't recognize that. Was it harmful to their health 100 years ago? Yeah, they didn't recognize it. Now, some would say, well, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And, but it doesn't change. You know, the, just because they don't accept it, that doesn't change the truth of it either. They, they may say, oh, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. But that's, it's true. If it's a truth, it has been, is now, will continue to be true forever. How about this one? Um, if you put your hand on a hot stove, it will burn you. Yep, that's true. Nope, mind over matter. It's not going to burn me this time. Psh, yep. It burned my right, but it won't burn. That's or right. even putting it to a vote. Oh, you're not burned. All in favor? <laughs> <laughs> it won't change. Right. Just to show you what a doofus you got up here. <laughs> I, I was told about that. My grandpa took me fishing every day in the summer. I had a great life in the summer. We'd work the day, listen to the game of the day, and go, you know, then we go fishing every night, have little league practice, go fishing. Anyway, we'd have a contest every day, see who could catch the most fish. My grandpa was a great fisherman. And we, he'd go one way on the creek, and I'd go the other way, and he'd let me pick whichever, which one I wanted to go. So, and he always beat me. This one day, I had a hot streak, I, you know, and when we got a limit, we come back to the truck. I beat him back to the truck this one day, it was raining, cold. So I got in the truck, 51 GMC pickups, where I learned to drive. At any rate, and waiting for Grandpa, you know, I'm like, but I see the cigarette lighter in front of me. So I push it in, you know, pull it out, and it goes around, orange circles, you know. Oh, gee, cool. Push it in again, and then around again. I wonder if that burned me. <laughs> so I push it in. Sure enough. I wonder if that would burn me. Yeah, it did. Got, I just got rid of the ringworm right here on the cheek all four or five years ago. No, <laughs> anyway. So anyway, that's the truth. That's the truth. Now this is one that I used. Okay, and, and, and I would say, do you think it's a truth or not to say that those young men and women who are sexually active in high school, that one day they will say, <clears throat> wish I hadn't done that. I use that. <laughs> and I got all varied responses here. No, no way. Cool. And, and yet some others would say, well, yeah, maybe. maybe. I said, now remember, it's a tr if it's a truth, it was true yesterday. It be tr it's true for everybody. It's not just selective. Okay? And, and so those who didn't, I picked the one who was most strident, and I said, okay, here you are. Fast forward, we'll use Reagan. I know. What? We, 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 we're going to use me. We use me. I can defame you know, better than me. I'm 14. I'm, no, I'm 16 in high school and, and, and sexually active and so on. And 20 years from now, or 15 years from now, I've got a daughter. She's going to the prom. She comes to her dad, me, and says, Dad, I love Freddie. Mm -hmm. After the prom, we want to go get a room. What are your response, Dad? <laughs> now, most, not always, but most of the time, oh, day. <laughs> they'd say, heck no, or something akin to that. <laughs> you know, so not all of them. Not all of them would, would see that, but that, that, that kind of changed the picture just a little bit, see. But, uh, and, I, and I always left it. I said, you just have to decide for yourself what you think that is. But uh, it's a food for thought, anyway. And by the way, it is a truth. They will regret that. You and I can say that. Can't say that in the school. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we hold these truths to be self-evident. What does self-evident mean? Give me a synonym for self-evident. Apparent. Apparent. Okay. How about? Obvious. Obvious. Excellent. Obvious. Okay. It is self-evident that Vic is wearing brown shoes. 
You don't even have to explain that. He looked out, yep, those are brown, those are shoes, and Vic's got them on. Well, That's technically, it. they're dark orange. <laughs> Reagan, you're screwing up my deep. No, just kidding. Just kidding. It's self-evident that Reagan is a doofus. No, just kidding. Just kidding. It's obvious. No explanation needed. No, just kidding. Anyway, it's obvious. It's self-evident that all that we hold these truths to be self-evident or obvious that all what? Men. Men. Uh oh, look out. Yeah. Any eyebrows going up here, ladies? Come on, Cassie. Mm -hmm. Any eyebrows? Okay. Yeah, the eyebrows went up. I don't know. Does it, any, any problem with that? All men are created equal? No, because we here know that when they referred to men, they meant all people. Are you sure? Well, maybe not, not in their day. No. Say not when they were alive. I'm sorry, not in their day. That's right. Okay. Just and men. so, you know, they say, oh, that's mankind. And that's what it means today. But when they wrote this, okay, for example, ladies, could you own land? Nope. Nope. Could you enter into contracts? Nope. nope. Could you uh, vote? Nope. No. See, none of that stuff. What? Could you, uh, for over could you uh, <laughs> make the meat, cook the meals? Yeah. yeah. Have the babies? Yeah. The end. Anyway, you see? We had to make clothes. Yeah, they do. They were spinning so yarn and all that stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah. So and if they worked on a farm or anything, they got to do that they labor did. too. They did. They did. They could they did. do the labor. Okay. You're welcome. No. <laughs> <laughs> so obvious, you know, that all men, that means mankind today, all men are created equal. Now how does it mean equal? Tell me what that means. The same. The same. Okay. How tall are you, Reagan? Um, uh, five foot two and a half. Five, two and a half. Let's see. I'm Go six six three, and yeah. two ninety. <laughs> what are you about? A hundred and twenty? Fifteen? Sure. Okay. I don't know what you're Whatever you say. See, what happened to equality here? Serious. <laughs> I'm two people, three people bigger than you. What happened to this all men are created equal thing? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> see. I got chipped. It must not mean that, right? Not physically. Mm -mm. How about mentally? Mm -hmm. See, now he just no. left me in the dust mentally. <laughs> you know, just the opposite is re is, is apparent there. See. It doesn't mean mentally. How about financially? No, yeah. unfortunately. What does it? So those are the things it doesn't mean. What does it mean to be e the equality of all persons? Of all the same rights. Hey, bingo. Yeah. Should you be treated under the law as I am treated? Yes. You think that's what they mean? Good. Mm -hmm. Equal treatment under the law. Equal treatment. How about this? How about equal opportunity? Yeah. think it means that? Mm -hmm. I think so. How about equal outcome? Mm -hmm. Negatory. It does and has never meant equal outcome. It means equal opportunity. But the, you've heard the old level playing field analogy. Everybody starts in the level playing. You don't have an advantage or a disadvantage. Just because you're a male or a female, it doesn't give you an advantage or a disadvantage. Your one ethnicity or race or gender, you know, whatever it is, is not an advantage or a disadvantage. Everybody starts the same. I believe that's what they mean. Equality of opportunity, not necessarily outcome. If you work harder, longer, smarter than me, and you get ahead, you're smarter than me, you're more successful than me, so, so be it. That's kind of the natural order of things. Okay? But equal opportunity, I believe that's what they meant. So, we hold these true, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed. Uh oh, there's a 50 cent word. Anybody know what endowed means? Given. Given. Provided. Dolly Parton was well endowed. Would <laughs> be bad to say that? Yes. It was. Yes. Okay, yes. scratch that. Don't know this. Grandchildren. We'll edit that. Oh, that's a good thing. They don't know Dolly. Mother Nature was very good. I say hello to Dolly all the time. At any rate, in given, provided, that they are endowed by their, uh oh, look out. Who are we talking about? Creator. What does it say there? Men. Endowed by their what? Creator. Creator. Who are we talking about here? God. What a heresy. This, you, ever, you ever heard of separation of church and state? Yeah, they, 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 <laughs> the, 
Today's generation, most, a lot of them, they don't want to have any mention of religion or deity or God in any way, shape, or form. There's a movement afoot to remove him from everything public. Okay? Now, there can be no more governmental document in the history of the world than this one, and yet, here they're talking about who? Creator. Okay, yeah, there too. There another. The Constitution, all of it. Later on in the Declaration, we're going to refer to it again. Your mom referred, alluded to that just a little bit. We'll get to it. Okay, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable. There's another fifty. Aliens. Un. No, mercy. Here we go. I knew that was coming. What does unalienable mean? Hey, mom. What does unalienable mean? Anybody? Unchangeable. Yeah. Can't change it. Can't take it away. Unalterable. But these rights that are given to us by our Creator are not given, us, given to us by man or governments or any other entity except God, the Creator. And so those rights cannot be taken away or changed in any way. That among these unalienable rights are... Life. Okay. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, we won't go into this now, but how does that dovetail with, say, Abortion. Ooh. See? That's a, that's a little food for thought. L liberty. I'm going to swing my fist. Oh, I'm going to go over there and swing my fist. Right? I'm exercising my liberty over there by somebody. Oh, I, Tyler's nose. Right <laughs> okay. Over by Tyler's nose. And I'm going to take one step forward and have him give a pint of blood for the Red Cross through the nose. <laughs> Is that, I'm exercising my liberty, right? Is that appropriate? Like liberty, there are some restraints on that liberty, but freedom is uh, is a part of that uh, part of that deal. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Okay, what do you suppose that means? You are allowed to live. You get to choose. Freely. That choice is so important. You get to choose. Okay. Life and liberty through that to secure these rights. Governments are instituted among men. According to the Declaration, what is the primary purpose of government? Secure those liberties. To secure those rights, liberty. those unalienable rights that we just spoke of. That's the primary purpose. It says it right. Uh, to secure these rights, governments are instituted or set up among men, deriving, what does the word deriving mean? Taken. Taken from, okay, deriving. They're just powers, powers that they should have, from the consent, give me a, what does consent mean? Permission. Advice. Permission. Okie dokie. From the okie dokie of the <laughs> governed. Who's the governed? Her. We the folks. We the folks. Not me. Where does Here. government get its power? The people. Us. Hopefully the people. You and I. Now. The problem is, is we tend to abdicate that responsibility. We are the source of power in this government. We really are. It's just that we kind of don't take that power. We don't assume it. We don't shoulder that responsibility. Okay? And there is, there's the problem. That's the problem. Deriving their just powers from the consent or okay of the people, the folks, the folks. Okay. Uh, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, what ends are we talking about? Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. If government ceases to do that, what that which that which is, is, is designed, that which that which it is designed to do, that of protecting the unalienable rights of the folks. We now, can destroy. That. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to. Abolish. Alter. What does alter mean? Change. Change, Change or? Alien. Abolish. Abolish. What was happening here in the Declaration of Independence? Were we altering or abolishing? Abolishing. abolishing. They were abolishing. They had tried to alter for about 160 some odd years. From 1607 to 1770, 169 years. They had lived under British rule. They had been taken advantage of in varying degrees, 
They tried to change it, they tried to plead, they tried to cajole, they tried to do everything they could to remain British subjects, but now they were saying, enough is enough. And that's what the next phrase says. Okay? Uh, what does the next phrase, how's it go there, at least? To alter or abolish, and to institute new government. Is that right? Yeah. They okay, can set up their own government. The next phrase is a big, long, flowery one, but it's a very simple one. Wow. Okay? It says, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Simple. It's a long phrase, but it has a simple meaning. They can change it any way they want. Laying the foundation of this new government on such principles and organizing the powers of this new government in such form as to them, the folks, again, shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness, to bring about their happiness and safety. They can change it any way they want, because they're the source of power. Okay. Now what's the next phrase, Elise? Uh, prudence. prudence. What's prudence? Hey, Elise. You have any idea? Anybody know what prudence is? Caution. A free. Caution. No, oh, a fruit. Yeah, that's what I take every morning. Stay regular. <laughs> Not prunes. Oh, sorry. I mistook that myself. No, just kidding. <laughs> Prudence. Okay, let's do this. Um, Elite, or, uh, uh, Alicia, you're going to go buy a dress. Yeah. You're going into the first store. Look to the right. See the first dress. You buy it. Are you a prudent shopper? No. What are you? A impulse. Impulsive. Impulsive. Hey, there it is. Got it. Let's go. In and out burger shopping. That's what I do. Okay. If you were a prudent shopper, what would you do? Go to every store, price check. And You're good. She knows about it. I, I picked on the right one here, I can tell. Price check. Okay, so what are some factors you might go into selecting the dress? Color, style, the season. Comfort. Okay, the price. <laughs> I was going to say, Tyler, what would you factor into this dress? <laughs> the price. Okay. The, what do they call it? The cut? The cut. Yeah, the cut. Uh, occasion, the appropriate, you know? Okay. The size. Right. Some people look better in some colors than others. Is that right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I never figured that one out, but I heard that somewhere. That's true. Okay. I look good in every color. I got my clothes at AAA tent and awning. That's as close as I go. At any rate, so all of those factors would go in. Cut, price, does it fit, you know, appropriate, summer, winter, all that stuff. Now, and then you would make a decision after factoring in all those things. That's what prudence means. Prudence, in this sense, in the governmental sense, says that governments long established, prudence, and dicta, prudence indeed will dictate, that government's long established. What does that mean? They've been around for a while. Yeah. Would England qualify in this regard? Yes. Oh man, they've been around since dirt. <laughs> yeah, they've been around a long time. Okay? They've been around a long time. Should not be changed for light. Light and transient, transient causes. Ooh, what does that mean? That's what we're facing in the church right now. A light and a trance, it changes? Yeah, that the, somehow the church should change because that's the way the world, world sees things. Yeah, oh, good. That's a good analogy. That's really good. Thank you. That's really good. That the church should change because the world sees it differently. Okay. Here, let's do this. You like my ensemble here? Got my black shoes on, black socks. What color is that pants? I don't know. Green? <laughs> blue? Green? Blue and green don't go together, do they? Sure. Uh, they're pretty good together. Okay. Any anyway, rate, so you don't like my ensemble, so you change teachers because you don't like my ensemble here. Would that be an example of changing teachers for a light and a transient cause? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, if you found out I didn't know anything about what we're talking about here and you know, what a doofus and all that stuff, that's not a light and transient cause. That's legit. Okay. But to change teachers because you don't like my hairdo. I need a haircut. Mm -hmm. okay. But that'd be a light and transient cause. Governments have been around a long time, must be doing something right. They shouldn't be changed for every little whim that comes down the pipe. Okay. And accordingly, all experience has shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils 
are suffering than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. Now that's a nice phrase here. Let's see if we can illustrate this way. Rep, you ever had a nosebleed? Yes. Did you like that? No. No, that's uncomfortable. You don't like that. Uh, do you go to the doctor every time you get a nosebleed? No. Why not? Because I can take care of it myself. Okay. You're not going to die from this unless you're a he what, hemophiliac, is that what that is? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hemophilia. You're not going to die from it. It's uncomfortable. It's no fun. You know, you know, stuff some stuff up there. Get your head back or pinch or I don't know, whatever you do. Okay. Have you ever had a headache? Yes. Yeah. You go, you go to the doctor and you get a head, headache. No. Why not? Because I'll be fine. You get a, this too shall pass. By the way, headaches are a myth. Did you know that? Really? <laughs> I've yeah. never had one. <laughs> the kids said, you're kidding. No, I never had. No brain, no pain. That's the only thing I've had. I've never had it. Anyway, okay. you don't go to the doctor. You can have an aspirin. You go lay down. And so okay. How about uh, um, upset stomach? You ever had one of those? Yes. Go to the doctor? No. no. pepto -bismol, although the cure is worse than the disease. <laughs> pepto -bismol, just gag a goat. I don't know about that. Anyway, you're not going to die from that. So you don't go to the doctor there. You ever sprained your ankle? Yes. Ooh. Ooh. Now we're getting closer. That's painful. Oof. If having babies hurts worse than that, I'm not either. No. <laughs> Just a little bit. Uh, I, She's the one who remembers it. Okay. Anyway, that, that's a painful injury. I mean, a snap, crack, or pop, you're like you're eating Rice Krispies. I remember hearing that. It's awful. Come down the side of somebody's foot, you know, oh, my head was painful. Anyway, do you go to the doctor when you get a sprained ankle? No. Nah. What do you do, Tyler? Doc? <laughs> When you get a sprained ankle, what do you do? Put a little ice on it, take some ice. ibuprofen, elevate it. Elevate it, ice, ibuprofen. But you okay. do go to the doctor to diagnose that it's a sprained ankle. Horse hockey. Because you may not know. Well, with, in your case, you knew it was a sprained ankle. Oh, I did. But some people don't know that. I have my own x ray machine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, these things, you're not going to die from any of these things. Okay? <clears throat> However, you see what's, what the analogy here is. Good, mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. What that's saying is you and I would rather overlook what government is doing to us. Maybe they're taxing us too much. Ah, I hate that taxes. Yeah, taking all my money. Uh, it stinks. Oh, those regulations. I don't want that. That's really gunky. I don't like that at all. Uh, well, you know, illegal immigration. I mean, what, whatever your bone to pick is with the government. But <clears throat> you'd rather overlook what the government is doing to you rather than say, Dad, government, we can't have this. Okay? You and I would rather overlook those things. Mankind are more disposed to suffer while these evils are suffering. They're not going to die if we overtax us a dollar or two, or they overregulate us or do this or that or 10,000 other things. But, let's carry on, but when a long train of abuses, notice the, the, the imagery here, a long train of abuses and usurpations, uh-oh, there's a 50 center, what's usurpations? Overturning, over. Okay, all right. Under, undermine, I don't, using your power to overtake. Okay, you, you know, I'm turning my back here and writing up on something in the back here. So Tyler doesn't like the way I'm doing this, so he grabs a chair and conks me over the head and knocks me in the noodle <laughs> and knocks me out colder in a wedge and he starts to teach the class or something, you see? He would be at that point usurping my authority to teach the class. See, the state gave me a license, otherwise I tricked him. <laughs> I tricked him. They gave me a license to do this. But he doesn't have a license to do it, so he is taking unto himself a power or a right that rightfully belongs to someone else. That is a usurpation that we're talking about. <clears throat> but when a long train of abuses by government and usurpations pursuing invariably, doesn't vary at all, the same object, evinces, which means the same thing, if all roads lead to Rome here, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism. What is despotism? Bottom of the barrel, as bad as it gets. Where government controls it all. Despotism. 
the king of England was declared to be a despot. Okay? A despotic form of government is a government that controls every aspect of life. I would submit to you communism is a, is a despotic form of controlling every aspect of life. Well, do, are you doing a report on communism? No, we just I've had some students and I've it's, it's lectured terrible. my children so they never say things that some of my students have said. I like fascism. <laughs> Fascism. Fascism. It's communism. Okay. <laughs> All of these things that government is doing to us has one object, and that's to reduce us under absolute despotism. It is their right. It is their duty. What's the difference between a right and a duty? Something that you can do, which is a right, or and a duty, something that you shouldn't, must do. Yeah, there is some obligation some responsibility. There's not only our right to do this, it is our duty to do this, to throw off such governments and to provide new guards for their future security. Okay. Questions on that? What time do you guys have to go home? Well, no. <laughs> There's always one. It's fine. How much longer? <laughs> the bell about to ring. The bell about to ring. <laughs> um, Can I get a drink of water? <laughs> okay, so let, let's click it off. I mean, there, there's more. We're going to do some more stuff here, but I mean, I, I can do it with Vic or something. We don't want to over tax you here. Yeah, it, it's been long enough. Let's. Okay, today we're going to talk a little bit about oh, capitalism. Yeah. Can you see me up there, Murdoch? <laughs> <laughs> Capitalism um, is the economic system. There are no purely socialistic, capitalistic, communistic, you know, all the systems. They're all mixed, but uh, some nations are heavily socialistic, some are heavily communistic, China and others and so forth, and others are heavily capitalistic. Now, up until a few years ago, the United States was heavily capitalistic. I fear, however, we are slowly getting away from those principles. And so I'd like to talk about some basic principles that are central to capitalism. Ones that I think are tried and true. Ones that we need to get back to in order to be more successful economically here. Uh, to illustrate this, I'd like to uh, use a, a story to, uh, to maybe illustrate that a little bit. Um, what we're illustrating first is the, the central key concept of capitalism, one of the central key concepts, is supply and demand. One of my favorite ice cream cones of all time is Baseball, baseball nut. nut. Right, Rhett new. Baseball <laughs> nut. You can only get it at Baskin Robbins. You got a mortgage, your firstborn to go get one, but I had one about 15 years ago, but I remember it was very good. <laughs> it was very, very good. Uh, and so, um, there's a class of students, 30 kids, 30 kids, at summer school. They've been there for five hours. This is going to be drone on about this or that or seven other things. Hot, the air conditioning has gone away in our illustration here. It's now noon, they're just about ready to get out. And um, during break time, one of the students left his class and went to the Baskin Robbins shop and brought back, he walked in the door right at the end of class, one triple-decker, baseball nut, ice cream cone, my personal favorite. And he walks up to me, he says, Mr. Larson, you're a supporter of capitalism and entrepreneurship. And I said, yes, I am. And he said, could I visit with a class here for just a minute? He, being an entrepreneur, recognized that the students, their attention went from me over to the door where he came in and saw this luscious triple-decker, baseball nut, ice cream cone, my personal favorite. And he walks up to the class and he said, all right, I'm going to hold a little auction here. What are my bids for this luscious triple-decker baseball nut ice cream cone? 
one of the students in the front row says, for two bucks. He said, two bucks? I paid more than that for it right to begin with. Another one said, five bucks. Another one in the back row, his tongue was hanging down a little bit. He said, five bucks, eight bucks, ten bucks, twelve, fifteen, twenty bucks. Okay? Twenty bucks, this one kid, you know, I got to have it, I'm gonna, I'll pay twenty bucks for that ice cream cone. And the guy said, sold. Twenty bucks. He walks back to deliver his ice cream cone back to this rotund individual that had bid twenty dollars for the triple decker baseball nut ice cream. When the door opens again, being the benevolent dictator that I am, I had previously arranged for the Baskin Robbins man to come in with thirty triple decker baseball nut ice cream cones. Being the last day of summer school, no air conditioning and they'd listen to me for six weeks, five hours a day, which is a violation of the Eighth Amendment's <laughs> cruel and unusual punishment clause anyway. The door opens and here comes 30 triple decker baseball nut ice cream cones for free. We pass them out. Now, the question was, the question is, is this young man in the back of the room, I asked him, I said, are you still willing to pay 20 bucks for that ice cream cone. He said, absolutely not. And I said, why not? Four seconds ago, you were willing to pay 20 bucks. What changed? And he said, I just got one for free. I said, what else changed? And he said, we now had 30. Everybody was going to get one. Okay. The supply of baseball nut ice cream cones went up by 30. Did everybody still want one? The demand didn't go down at all. The demand didn't change at all, but the supply went up by a factor of 30. What happened to the value of that one young person's ice cream cone that's now dripping down his elbow to the top of it? It went to what? What do you think, Rep? Where'd it go? Zero. Zero. Got one for great. Okay. And the difference was the supply went up, the demand stayed the same. Okay? Let me give you a couple of other examples. Why is it, Cassie, that diamonds are so important? I can ask you that one because girls always like diamonds, right? Yeah. Why are diamonds so expensive? Why do you think? Why are they so expensive? Why are diamonds? Are, why are they so expensive? Because they're rare? Yeah. Can you pick them up along the road here somewhere? No. No. In fact, there's only one state in the whole United States that you can get any diamonds anywhere. The home of Bill and Hillary Clinton originally. Arkansas? Arkansas. I mean, yeah, Arkansas. <laughs> right? Arkansas. Most of them are South Africa, you know, and so forth. So, they're not common. They're, they're, they're rare. All right? Are there any other factors that might make diamonds more expensive? Right? They, uh, you can't reproduce them. Uh, it takes the time it takes and the pressure and all of that. Unless you're Superman, Odin, <laughs> that can crush a piece of coal into a diamond <laughs> to make a diamond. It takes tons and tons and tons of pressure over a long, long period of time to make, that's where diamonds come from, is from coal. But yeah. it takes a long time and a lot of pressure to make them, okay? Yeah. So it's very difficult to make them. They're the hardest substance known to man. Cut a glass with a diamond. Cut a glass with a diamond. And what about the demand? Cassie, would you like to have a few more? Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to have a few myself. <laughs> Cubic zirconies, diamonds. Okay. Do you see that? You see what what we're talking about here? The supply is very low. The demand is very, very high. The value, they're beautiful. They're cut properly and so forth. And so the cost of those things, if any of you watching this haven't gotten married yet or engaged, when you go to buy a diamond and you find the one you want to settle down with for the rest of your life, make sure you're sitting down when they start showing them to you because you'll fall down. The price is through the roof. Very, very expensive. Very expensive. That illustrates, I think, very vividly the supply and demand. Now, let's change that. Shale. 
You know what I shale is, Rhett? You know what that is, right? Yeah. Where do you get shale? Everywhere. You make mountains out of shale. <laughs> Sedimentary rock make mountains out of it. My grandpa and I used to go up Montpelier Canyon and we drag the trailer up there. And he put it next to his, which where he kept his trailer, uh, up, leading up to his chicken coop and stuff. But it's everywhere. What's the value of shale? Zero. You can't give it away. You can't give shale away. You can't give it away. Okay? Because the supply is mountains. The demand is yeah. Value? Nothing. Okay? I have a an eight track player. What are my bids? How much will you pay me for it? <laughs> okay. See, eight track, those were great though. They were great. You know, these things you get today, you can fast forward, listen to the same song 48 times in a row if you want to. Eight track player, if you put that into your car, there was no fast forward. You had to drive around the block 18 times to hear that song come up again on the 8-track play. You know, I just put it in there. So. There's no demand. If I got one, that's one too many. <laughs> See, supply and demand. Supply and demand. Okay, so we've illustrated supply and demand, and it has a great deal to do with price. 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 Okay. Now, one other story illustration. Um... We're going to use Rhett here. He's going to he's going to uh, start his own business. He's thought long and hard about starting this business. He has saved up a thousand dollars, scrimped together, and saved a thousand dollars. He's thought about it himself. He's thought long and hard, and he decides on his own that the business that he would like to start is a whoopee cushion business. There's a shortage of whoopee cushions according to Rhett. So he researches it and he goes and researches what goes in to make a whoopee cushion. There's cloth to cover it and there's a bladder inside that makes the noise, you know, you know that sort of thing. And so he goes and he buys the components of the whoopee cushion. He goes down to his basement and he creates a whoopee cushion, one. Goes to school, puts it on the chair of the girl next to him. And she sits down. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and she says, where did you get that? And he said, I made it. He said, you made it? What for? He said, well, I just started a whoopee cushion business. It was pretty good. It kind of tickled me. You know, <laughs> popped her up off the seat or something. At any rate, she says, well, do you think, would you make me one? Yeah. How much you charge? It? Ten bucks. Will you make me one? Yeah. So, hey, Rhett's got a sale. He goes down the next day after school and he makes a whoopee cushion. Comes back, gives it to her, gets his 10 bucks. Okay? She takes it to the next class and puts it on a chair in the next class, the next class. By the end, you know, the word spreads that Rhett's got a whoopee cushion business. He's now got three orders the next night. He gets. Heck with this. SOS driving stuff. I'm going to whoopee cushion. At any rate, so he sews up, he makes three whoopee cushions. He brings them to school, passes them out, got ten bucks a piece. He sold four. How much he made so far? Forty. Forty yeah. bucks. Okay. Now, those people go to young men's or young women's or parties or the games and they put them on the chairs of others. The next night, he's got twenty orders. Now, it took you all night to make three. You didn't get any sleep that night. You were working, putting together. You now got 20 orders. What are you going to do? Got to hire some people to help me out. Got to hire some people. You got two or three friends over here, deadbeats, or no, <laughs> that need a job, and so he hires them. How much are you going to pay him? Three bucks a whoopee cushion. Three bucks a cushion. It's a piece rate, okay? That's, that's called piece rate. That happens quite often. Okay, so he's going to pay him three down. Does that three bucks that you're going to pay them, that comes off of your profit. profit. By the way, why did you go into this business? Make money. To make money. That's a central key concept in capitalism. That's why businesses are created, is to make money. Now that sounds a little crass, a little hard and so forth, but that's why businesses are created. If in the process of making money, they can create a service, 
or a product that people need and want and is valuable and is needed and what and so forth. That's a great thing. But the real reason businesses are started is to make money. Okay? So these this three bucks per or the minimum wage or whatever you're gonna pay them comes off of your profit. Okay? Which means you won't make as much money per cushion, but why would you hire them then? Because of the supply or the demand. You've got to make 20 and you can't make 20 all by yourself. You've got to have some help. So every entrepreneur, every capitalist has to make that decision. Will I make more money if I hire more people and can produce more whoopee cushions? Or will I make more money if I just stick doing it myself, make less whoopee cushions, but I make more per cushion? Now, Rhett's decision was he needed to you know, make 20. And even though he'll make, uh, you know, with all the materials and so forth, we'll say he was making uh, seven to six dollars per cushion. He had to make the cloth and the bladder and all this stuff. But when he's going to pay three dollars per cushion, he might only make five dollars. But he's going to sell twenty. Five times twenty is how much you're going to make that next day. A hundred bucks. See, a hundred bucks. Okay. All right. Now, we carry the story a little further here. You gotta hurry. Folks are coming to have dinner here in a few <laughs> minutes. All right, so he, Rhett is very successful. He hires these three people, and they go down in his basement, and then now they've got 50 orders. Wait a minute. We had a tough time fitting everybody down in my basement, so now what do you gotta do? Gotta find a place to manufacture. Yeah, little little tables and stuff, and you just line it out there, and each has their own little spot to, well, I'll do this part, and I'll sew, and you put the bladder in, you know, or whatever. You know, you, if you do an assembly line, and so if you can make more cushions, but you have a spot to do that. So you have to go out and rent a, rent a, a warehouse or an office or some little space to improve your business so you can make these people more productive. Okay, but you have to pay for that. Does that reduce the, the profit that you make on each cushion? Yep, it's called overhead. Mm -hmm. All of those things are called overhead. The bladder, and so the thread, and the cloth, and the, I don't know what goes into a whoopee cushion, and all of those things. <laughs> and now you've got to buy some tables, you got to maybe buy some chairs, and, you, uh, and so forth. But you're, you're successful. You keep expanding that business. You hire more people, okay? You're so successful, we'll say, that you go to school one day at the end of school and you drive up the day before graduation in a 2016 Mercedes-Benz 500 SL convertible, red. And you pull up to the person next to you, it happens to be Cassie, you're not married yet. And Cassie says, where'd you get that? And Red says, I just bought it, paid cash. Paid cash? What, you rob a bank? Nope. Whoopee cushion business is superb. <laughs> it's been so superb that Rhett bought out every competitor that makes whoopee cushions in the world. He bought them all out. You now have what is called a... Monopoly. A monopoly. Okay. Now... Rhett, remember you're going into business to make money. Yes. How can you make more money? Charge more for every whoopee cushion. Yeah. Ten bucks, what the heck? <laughs> We're going to twenty. We're going to fifty. Hey, you're We're going to a hundred bucks a push. What? You're serious. Yeah. I'm serious? Yeah, you are. Well, okay, I'm serious. I'm serial, maybe. No. Anyway, so you're gonna make more money. How else could you make a little more money per cushion? Hire some employees. <laughs> yeah, you could do that, make a few less cushions. How about you go out and find a bladder that is a little less expensive? Or instead of 500 stitches around your cushion to make them secure, eh, cut that back to 250. Could you make more cushions? See, it yeah. takes less time to 250 instead of 500. Make more cushions, and the bladder is less expensive. What has just happened to the quality of your cushions? Way down. It's gone down. Is that typical? 
Yep. Okay? When you had a monopoly, you wanted to make more money, so you could charge more, and the quality of your cushion went down. Now, transfer this over to SOS. If I was the only driver's ed business in the country or the world, I guarantee you, you'd be paying through the nose if you're going to pay, you're going to get the man, you're going to pay the man. <laughs> you see? We wouldn't spend staying much time making sure they knew, yeah, well, you know, we'll cut that back. We'll cut that back a little bit. We won't get a Camaro. We'll go get a Nash Rambler. Call it good. See? We won't get these newer cars. We'll get some of these old crummy things because they're less expensive. Okay? And, uh, you know, we won't quite do 30 hours of classroom. We might do 25. 20. Call her good. You know? The instruction, not quite so good. The service, ah, if you want to come take driver's ed, you got to meet my schedule, not me meeting your schedule. You see? So, you see what we're talking about here. When there is a monopoly, which is the antithesis of a, of a capitalist society, when there's a monopoly, the price of the service or the product goes sky high and the quality goes way down. Now, what's that? What's that, Odin? You're even more and more serious. I'm more and more serious? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just about done here. We're about ready to have something to eat. Okay. That is pretty typical of uh, a non-capitalist society. Okay? Now, you pulled up next to Cassie. She's going in there. It's okay. And she says, where'd you get that uh, Mercedes? I paid for cash. Now, Cassie, what are you thinking here? It's getting mighty fine. Mighty fine. Okay. How about this? I'm a provider, babe. <laughs> You're not married. Oh, okay. No? He, she's saying. Now, Red's pretty smart, but I'm just as smart as he is. If he can do it, maybe you could do it. You can do it too. Hey. Competition. Yeah, I can do this. So she thinks about it. She says, "I wonder what I could do to." Uh, Get some people to buy some of them. You know, if I did whoopee cushions, what could I do? What What's one thing or two things you could do maybe to attract some whoopee cushion buyers to your whoopee cushion, Cassie, if you were wanted to do, do this? Mm, charge less. Charge less. Okay. Instead of 10 bucks, I'll we'll go to eight. Okay. Anything else you can think of to do? Mm. How about making a louder whoopee cushion. Mm. See, his kind of just, you know, okay, that's good. Yours, better quality. yeah, okay. You go and get a bladder that if you sit on this baby, it pops you right up off the chair. You know, mm -hmm. really, that's pretty good. How about his and then her and whoopee cushions? That's better than my and and your <laughs> Oh, sorry. Anyway. Dual whoopee cushions. How about glow in the dark whoopee cushion? You know, I don't know. We're just going at this. You see, you see the quality of the product is now going up, and she, her first thought was, well, we can reduce the price. What element did we just introduce when Cassie came into the picture? Competition. 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 That is a key element of capitalism, is competition. Competition. When there is an element of, camp of competition, the quality of the product goes up big time and the price goes down. See? Just the reverse of, uh, of a monopoly or a non capitalist society. We talk about health care. This is a prime example here. One of the problems with health care is so expensive, you can't afford to get sick. You guys know you've been to the doctor a few times. You, know, you can't afford to get sick because it's so expensive. One of the reasons health care is so expensive is it lacks competition. There's no competition. We got one hospital. They got a monopoly, virtually. They have a monopoly. You want to get health care, you got to go there. Well, if we introduce the element of competition in healthcare, where not just Blue Cross provides the 
service that all of the health care providers could compete, the quality of the health care would go up, the cost of health care would go down, but we haven't figured that out yet. I, I, I don't know why we haven't come to that, you know, Hillary Clinton wants to go to a single-payer system where the government provides it all. Just a socialist, med socialized medicine. Well, name me one program where the government does well. I mean, better than the private sector, maybe we'll put it that way. They might protect us from the army. They need to do that. But dang, virtually anything else. If you could introduce the private sector at a capitalist process, it would go better. Now, I know we may have some postmen out there, but post office. Who could do better than the, the, deliver the mails and the packages? Well, we already got them. American Express, Sprint, and you know, all of those. We can't figure out where our alien, you know, illegal aliens are in the United States. Well, American Express and Sprint and all these others can tell you where a package is at any point in time, at any, you know, all the way along the process. They can track it, turn it over to American Express and find out where these people are. They do. They know how to do it. The government generally does not. You know, they just simply do not. And so, this capitalism that we have gotten away from, we need to reestablish. Now, Odin, I see your hand over there. What can I do for you? Um, I know where mail comes from. Do you know where milk comes from? Mail. Oh, mail? Where does it come from? It comes from the mailman. From the mailman, that's right. He delivers your mail. But first it goes to Boise, even if it's mailed here in Twin Falls. <laughs> Gotta go all the way to Boise, then back to Twin Oh yeah, that's an efficient system. That's great, that's great. At any rate, so there's capitalism. There's capitalism. So let's uh, shut her off and let's uh, get the dinner ready to go and then we'll... Uh, Okay, we've got to finish this up here. We don't want to belabor this any longer, but uh, two or three other little things that I need to mention here. Folks were coming over for dinner and other things uh, Sunday a couple of days ago, and we had to stop before we actually got finished with the uh, discussion on capitalism and so forth. Two or three things that I want to mention here. The biggest difference between capitalism, socialism, and communism is the choice factor. In our example that we use, uh, Rhett got to choose what business he started. In a socialist country, and even more so in a communist country, those decisions primarily are made by the government. What to produce, how much to produce, what to charge for it, all of those decisions uh, are made by the government as opposed to the private individual. In my mind, the one of the geniuses of capitalism is the fact that the people get to choose. Next to life itself, in my mind, one of the great blessings that we have in this life is the ability to choose what we do. This innate yearning for freedom, I think, is in, in every person. Every person. Not just Americans, every person. And when given that opportunity, they embrace it, and it can be a great blessing to them. It can, as I've mentioned before, it could be a liberating thing. It can also destroy them in many ways, and thus the danger of choice. But the ability to start his whoopee cushion business, he decided that. He invested his own money, his own sweat equity. And of course, in our example, he succeeded wildly made lots of money and so forth, and that can happen in capitalism. However, the reverse can also happen. One of the biggest uh, criticisms of capitalism is the wild fluctuations in uh, success and failure, in uh, extravagant wealth and extreme poverty. And that is true. That is true. Except, Rhett could have lost his investment. He could have failed in his attempt to uh, to start his whoopee cushion business. Cassie could have succeeded or lost. But the genius of capitalism is that doesn't mean that you're a loser if you happen to fail in one endeavor. 
That just means you didn't find something that would be successful now. Maybe the folks aren't ready for whatever business you've chosen or product you've chosen to produce. The genius of capitalism is you get up, you dust yourself off, and you go find something that will work. The best example I can so that would support that theory is Thomas Edison. If you know anything about the life of Thomas Edison, he spent his life in experimenting, in, in, in pursuing truth, in, in pursuing knowledge and, and inventing. We, of course, revere him for the incandescent light bulb that he invented. However, what most people don't realize about Thomas Edison is that during his lifetime, he literally failed thousands of times, thousands of times. His approach, however, is refreshing and one that we could all take. His approach, when he failed, was, well, there's one more thing that does not work. We're closing in on it to find something that does work. And of course, we now don't think about all of the failures that he had to suffer. We only revere him for the wonderful invention of the incandescent light bulb. But he spent his whole life in his endeavor to find something that would work, and it uh, finally did. That's the genius of capitalism. We get to choose. We get to decide how much to produce. The people get to decide what to charge for and let the market uh, decide what the value of your product or your service is. Uh, if there's a great, like I mentioned, if there's a great demand and a low supply, the price will go sky high. If there is moderate demand and moderate supply, the price will go there. In a, in a more moderate level, and just the reverse is also true. Okay, one last thing, one last area we want to cover, and then we're going to finish this. I don't want to belabor this and make it a real, it's already too long, but there's one other area that I absolutely have to talk about before we finish, and that's the Constitution of the United States. We could spend days, weeks, months talking about this, but what I'd like to do is just spend the next few minutes, very few minutes, talking about some basic principles contained within the Constitution that make it a genius document. Basic principles. There are lots more in there that we could talk about, but I'd like to just talk about those basic principles. The first one I'd like to discuss is popular sovereignty. What that simply means is the people are the source of power in government. The people ultimately hold the power in government. We get to choose. We get to decide who will win an election or who will lose an election. What laws ultimately will be, will be passed or not passed by electing uh, elected officials both at the local level, state level, and federal level that reflect our views. That is an ingenious idea. One person or a small group of person uh, make the decision in most of the rest of the world. Uh, but in the United States, in a democracy, in, uh, in, our, in our capitalist and constitutional system, it is the people who ultimately get to decide what laws are passed, who is elected, what values they should inculcate within their, uh, within their lives, and so forth. Now, let me give you two or three examples of this popular sovereignty as espoused by the Founding Fathers. The very first words of the preamble of the Constitution are, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, and so forth. We the people are the first words that the Founders came up with. They recognized that the people would make right decisions most of the time, as opposed to one single individual or a small group. Another example of this idea of popular sovereignty, in the Declaration of Independence, as you recall, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new governments. The people have that power. The people have that power. It is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Talk, speaking of the people, it is our right, it is our duty, which we've spoken of before. And of course, we go to Abraham Lincoln's famous Gettysburg Address, where he said, 
government of the people, for the people, and by the people. He recognized the importance of the participation of people in this decision-making process. The Constitution created government and gave power to the people to control it. They gave power to the people to control it. We'll, we'll go on and talk about this a little bit further, but it's the right of the people to expand the powers of government as they choose to. They also have that right to restrict the powers of government if they choose to, because the ultimate decision rests with the people. Okay. The next principle we want to talk about is that of limited government. Limited government. I just mentioned that just a moment ago. Government is not all powerful. In and of itself, government has absolutely no power. It only has those powers that you and I choose to extend to it. And as I mentioned, we have the opportunity to expand the powers of government, which we have done uh, many, many times in our history. I would say the last two presidential elections the people have voted to expand the power and perspective of the federal government big time as they elected President Obama. There's no question about that. He has expanded the power and perspective of the presidency and the federal government big time. Now, we have the opportunity in future elections to continue to expand it if we choose to or restrict the power of government as we elect individuals who take a different view. But the ultimate power resides with the people, with the people. James Madison said that every word of the Constitution decides a question between liberty and power. Liberty and power. Every word of the Constitution decides a question between liberty and power. Should we have more power to the government, more influence from the government? Should we restrict Okay. Too much power, too much, too many laws restrict the freedom of the pe of the folks. Too much freedom, and you have anarchy. You have anarchy, uh, where the folks just run amok. If there are no laws, if there are no rules, no regulations, uh, there is no there is no law and order at all. So there's a great balance between power and liberty in this constitution. Much of the Constitution is a statement of restricting power. The very first words of the First Amendment to the Constitu Constitution are, Const or not Constitution, Congress shall make no law with respect to the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. And it goes on and talks about the similar kinds of power with regard to speech and the press and assembly and petition. Those are the five rights guaranteed in that First Amendment. But <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Con Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or the free exercise thereof. This is a restriction on government. Congress is a central key figure in this government that the Constitution provided, that set it up. But it has to be restrained. It has to be restrained. Uh, the people have the ultimate authority to do that if they will elect individuals who have that similar view. They can expand it further, they can restrict it as well. Let me give you another example. In the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, the amendments, the amendments, the first ten amendments, the Bill of Rights were added to the Constitution to restrict the power of the federal government. The Tenth Amendment is a prime example of that. It says that all powers not specifically granted to the federal government or denied to the states shall be given to the states or to the people. What that simply means is the Founding Fathers recognized that the federal government they just escaped from one tyrant, the King of England. They did not want to replace the King with another tyrant, as I've mentioned before. And so they placed within these amendments, the first Ten Amendments to the Constitution, a restrictive power on the federal government. The Tenth Amendment is the prime example. It basically says 
that we have given powers to the federal government and those are the powers that the federal government should have and none else. All powers not specifically granted to the federal government, and I'm going to add parenthetically, or denied to the states, all other powers that are not mentioned in the Constitution, and it's impossible to mention them all, all of the situations that will arise over the 200 plus years of our history, all other powers that would come up should be given to the states or to the people, and I would say again parenthetically, not to the federal government. This is a restriction on the powers of the federal government, and I fear we have gotten away from that idea big time gradually over our history. All right, one other idea that we want to talk about. The separation of powers doctrine. Separation of powers. Very simply put, the genius of the Constitution set up three separate and distinct and co-equal branches of government. The executive made up of the president, um, which has the power to enforce the law. The Congress, which uh, is made up of the Senate and the House of Representatives at the federal level and in most state levels. And their responsibility is to make the law. And the judicial branch, which is the interpretive body, interpreting what those laws would mean, what those laws would mean, and the acts of the president could be overseen by the judicial branch. This power structure that is set up by the Constitution cannot be altered or changed in any way by any one branch of government. The president can't say to the Congress, we don't need you anymore, I'll just make the laws myself. The courts can't say to the, to the president, hey, we'll take care of that, don't worry about it, we'll enforce the laws for you. The Constitution is very specific in its duties for these three branches, being separate, distinct, and co-equal with each other. Uh, the, the Congress can't say, we will enforce the law, we'll interpret the law, we'll just take care of it, you other two branches go away, we don't need you anymore. Can't do it, it's illegal. Prime example here, a few years ago, the, con the Congress, while well, Bill Clinton was president, passed a, uh, a law which gave the President of the United States what's called a line item veto, which would allow him to veto parts of a law and leave other parts intact. Well, he had it for a little bit, but it was challenged in the courts, the judicial branch, and it was found to be in violation of this very sacred doctrine of separation of powers. And it was rescinded. The president no longer has the line item veto. Most of our governors do, the president does not. To the chagrin of some, to the delight of many others. They said that it would give too much power to the executive branch, the president, and take too much power away from the legislative branch as the founders intended. So the separation of powers of doctrine, and again I fear we've gotten away from it. Critical of President Obama, he has used uh, the power that he has assumed called the executive privilege dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Other presidents have used executive privilege and it's not mentioned in the Constitution at all, but other presidents have used it sparingly. President Obama has used it dozens and dozens of times uh, where he basically says, I will make the law. I will make the law irrespective of the Congress. That, in my mind, is a gross violation of this doctrine of separation of powers and should not have been allowed and should not be allowed to continue. The change in this power structure, as I mentioned, can't be done by any one branch. The only way to change the power structure in the Constitution is to amend the Constitution itself. And that is a very difficult process. As you know, it requires uh, two-thirds of the House of Representatives, that's 290 out of 435 members of the House, two-thirds of the Senate, 67 senators out of 100 have to agree that this is a good change, and then three-quarters, three-fourths of the state legislatures must agree that this proposed amendment should be adopted all within a seven-year period. Very difficult to do, purposefully made so by the founders in their ingenious system. 
They did not want this Constitution to be chained by every little whim that came down the pipe. They wanted it to be a consensus by the vast majority of the folks and their representatives, both at the executive level, legislative level, for a, uh, an amendment to the Constitution to be passed. As evidenced by the fact that after the Bill of Rights were adopted in 1791, and they were all adopted at the same time, We've only had 17 amendments to the Constitution that have been ratified over our 230 plus year history. All right. The reason for that is James Madison, James Madison, the father of the Constitution, uh, which is a primary, he wrote the Federalist Papers, uh, he and John Jay and Alexander Hamilton, and I know I just perked everybody's interest with that, with that name given the popularity of the Broadway show, wrote the Federalist Papers, but James Madison said this, the accumulation of power, legislative, executive, or judicial in the same hands may be defined as the very definition of tyranny. Too much power in too few hands is tyranny. They railed against it originally when the Constitution was set up. They set up guidelines and strict control so that it could not happen because of the separation of powers doctrine. Federalism is another con uh, concept that I'd like to just briefly mention. Okay? One of the toughest questions of the Constitution Convention was, should we have a strong federal government and yet maintain the power and integrity and influence of the state and local government? Well, the system they came up with to ensure that we did have a strong enough federal government that could protect us and do the things that the federal government should do, and yet maintain the integrity and the viability of the states and local governments was called federalism. What it basically does is, does is it divides the power between the federal and state governments. The Constitution gives each of these levels of governments powers and responsibility. For example, the federal government has the power to coin money, to regulate interstate trade, to uh, negotiate treaties, uh, to build and maintain an armed service. See, those are the powers, some of the powers, that's not all of them, that the Constitution gave to the federal government. The state governments were given power to conduct elections, uh, to uh, provide for education. Our education system is based at the state level, not at the federal level. Now, the federal government's becoming more and more involved in education with uh, these programs that they've introduced and so forth, but primarily this, the responsibility for elections and uh, education is that of the states. They control intra-state commerce, the commerce within the borders of their state. And so this system was set up so that the states could be viable, but have a strong enough federal government to perform the duties that they're, they're required to do. We fought a civil war to decide whether or not the states would predominate or that there should be a federal government with power strong enough to meet the needs of society. Uh, the bloodiest war in our history, uh, the, uh, the Confederacy wanted the states to predominate. The Union wanted a viable federal government but with integrity and strong states as well. And of course, that civil war, we're familiar with that. One of the Next principles is called the checks and balances. This is a long, drawn-out process, but what it amounts to is each branch of government should have a check, not control, but a check over the other two branches of government so that no one branch of government could become too powerful, as was evidenced by the separation of powers. We didn't want the president or the Congress or the courts to become too powerful at all. Uh, there are lots of them, but let me just cite one or two. Uh, the president, the president uh, has checks over the Congress. For example, he can call a special session of Congress if he chose to. The president can veto legislation proposed and passed by the Congress. He has that authority. He doesn't have to give a reason why, he very often does, but he can veto that legislation, then it goes back to the Congress and the Congress can override that veto, uh, thus a check that the Congress has over the President. 
Now, it requires, uh, like I say, a supermajority in both houses of Congress to override a presidential veto, very rarely done, but they do have that opportunity to do so. Okay? The president also can recommend legislation. Most of the legislation that you and I read about in our newspapers and TV and so forth comes from the president. That doesn't mean the senators and the congressmen in the House and the senator are just sitting on their thumb waiting for the president to send them something to do. They generate lots and lots, thousands of very important bills and discuss them and pass them. But the biggies generally originate with the president. Okay? Like I mentioned, the Congress has power or a check, or several checks over the president. Uh, we said overriding a presidential veto by a two-thirds majority in both the House and the Senate would be examples of that. Uh, the Congress can impeach the president. Uh, uh, we've had a couple of presidents impeached. Richard Nixon, he resigned before he was uh, the process was actually brought to fruition. Bill Clinton was impeached. Uh, was not convicted, but he was impeached. Impeachment simply means charges being brought against the president that if convicted, he could be removed from office. Most people think impeachment means they're removed from office. No. We had Andrew Johnson, the vice president of uh, Abraham Lincoln, was impeached. His basic problem was he wanted to kiss and make up with the southern states, let bygones be bygones, and the Republican-dominated Congress wanted to punish the southern states for the Civil War and the horrors that were associated with it. And uh, basically, you know, that and two or three other things led to his impeachment, and Andrew Johnson came within one vote in the Senate. One vote in the Senate from being removed from office. That's as close as we've ever come to having a president removed. So that is another check that the legislative branch. The Senate ratifies all treaties negotiated by the, uh, by the president. The treaties don't go into effect unless the Senate ratifies them, which leads me to another one. The President negotiates lots of executive agreements these days, which does not require Senate approval. And so, again, they're not in the Constitution. But the President's kind of end run around the Senate confirmation of a treaty by calling them executive agreements. The Senate also ratifies presidential appointments to the Cabinet and other uh, uh, major offices. The big one of the biggest ones is the Congress appropriates the money. The President can propose to spend X amount of dollars on this and that and thousands of other things. But when it's all said and done, it's the Congress that has to appropriate that money. We're all well over $20 trillion in debt. Who's to blame? Well, there's plenty of blame to go around. The President for proposing, the Presidents for proposing that level of expenditure and the Congress for allowing that level to be ratified and put into effect. And of course, the executive over the judicial branch, the president nominates all federal judges. If you want to be a federal judge, you have to get your name before a president. He's the one that, that uh, uh, nominates all federal judges. Okay? The president can grant pardons and reprieves and commute sentence. He can grant amnesty, which was a big topic in our country today. Uh, the checks that the courts have over the president is that the courts can declare acts of presidents to be unconstitutional. During the Watergate hearings, Richard Nixon routinely audio taped all of his telephone conversations going in and out of the Oval Office. Well, during the investigation of Watergate, they found out that that was the case. They subpoenaed those audio tapes. Mr. Nixon claimed executive privilege and did not produce them. Well, to make a long story short, they went to court and the court said that the president, President Nixon, had acted unconstitutionally by withholding those, those audio tapes because they could be potential evidence in a criminal proceeding. And he did produce them, but as we know in the Watergate investigation, his secretary, Rosemary Woods, uh, in transposing those audio tapes, hit the wrong button a few dozen times, creating an 18-minute gap. And of course, those who are suspicious there think, well, that's where he was talking about Watergate and his involvement in it. Now, the judicial also has uh, power over the uh, legislative branch. They can declare, the, the courts can declare acts of Congress to be unconstitutional, that the Congress acted unconstitutionally by passing this law or that law. So, again, the checks and balance system, there are many, many more that we could go into, but I don't want to belabor it any further. Uh, 
the uh, federal judges also serve for life. Once the uh, federal judges are nominated and confirmed by the Senate, uh, they never come up for renomination or reconfirmation. They do serve for life, and that would be another check that the uh, courts have over the over the president. All right. At any rate, we, I want to conclude this by simply saying um, we know as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints that this great constitution was inspired to be written by great men inspired of our Father in Heaven. Our Father in Heaven had his hand in the creation of this constitution which has produced in my mind the greatest and freest and most generous society in the history of the world, the United States. We must defend these principles. We must defend this Constitution. We must get involved to the point where we do not allow these freedoms and these liberties and these principles contained within the Constitution because they are divinely inspired to be changed, to be altered in significant ways. Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, came to the United States and toured and toured and he went back to France and he said something like this. He said, the two things that stuck out to me, he said one of the strengths of the American people is their <coughs> adherence to religion. Their adherence to religion. The, the American people are good people. He said that America will continue to be great as, a long, as long as America is good. If America ceases to be good, it will cease to be great. And I believe that wholeheartedly. We in the United States uh, are the most generous people on the planet. Whenever there's a, a disaster in the world, the United States is always first to meet that desire, disaster and try to meet the needs of people and governments and people uh, throughout the world. When there are problems in the United States, uh, not much comes out of it, which is okay which is okay. But we, uh, we are so blessed to be here. Most of the rest of the world would give up any and everything that they have and own to be where we are and live in this free and fair society. We have problems. We need to deal with them. And as disheartening as the pleasant, present political situation is, um, we're two weeks away from the next election with Trump and Hillary, um, I, solace comes from, uh, we're not as yet like Mormon and Moroni, where they were the only ones left. Uh, we're certainly not to that point. We cannot give up. We must adhere to those principles. We need to espouse them and support them in whatever way we can and elect individuals that would most closely resemble our political views and our moral views and uh, to protect these freedoms and liberties in the United States, which we, uh, which we uh, love so much. Thanks so much for your time. Hope this hasn't been too much of an uh, arduous task, but I'd like to uh, thank you for your opportunity and your request to do this. Thanks very much.